All right, this is Physics 1C for October the 11th, and uh, we're today going to be talking about electric current, current density, resistivity, what's called EMF, and uh, electrical power. So a lot of topics, but that's most, most, of these, most of this stuff is very conceptual, and the like equations we're going to use are going to be really simple. So um, one thing to start with, though, is at the end of class last time, we, uh, we looked at these two uh, problems. Uh, involving capacitor networks, and I just wanted to kind of briefly talk about how you solve them. Okay, so in the network that we have here, um, you can see what the values of the capacitors are, like C2 right here, I'll put it on the picture, is 10, and C1 is 5, so this is like a 5, a 10, a 10, C2 is also 10, and then C1 is and the one in the middle is C3 and it's 2. So if we break this capacitor network down, what we can do is we can notice that the two over here are in parallel. And when capacitors are in parallel, you can add them together. So this can break down to, here, let's go to the right so that it's, so there's more room to work. So let's go this way. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to break down these two and two of the ones in the top. Okay, with the writing being that thick, I think I need to zoom out just a little bit. Okay, so there's that, and there's one in here. There's this one. And all these connect up to this one. Okay, so the 10 and the 10, we're gonna add those together to get 20. Is that right, when they're parallel, you add them? Five and the 10 right here, are they in series or are they in parallel? Whoops, I'm not on the right thing. Professor, if you have time, can you show us how to do lab manual 379 part B? Uh, sure, after class maybe. Uh, can we finish the example we left? Well, okay, we're doing that. Still a bit confused on how to work back with circuits. Can I ask tomorrow's office hours? Yeah. Uh, okay, so they look like they're in parallel, the 5 and the 10, they do, I know. But the thing is that you can you can draw a line. In order for something to be parallel, you need to be able to get from point A to point B without, like, um, so, so let me just show you. So with if I go this way, I can basically get to this kind of point, um, and, I, and I didn't pass through C2 over here. And I can do the same thing with this one, okay? But if I start, for example, from this point right here and I want to get to point A, if I pass through this one, the only way to get to point A is by also passing through C1 again, which means they have to be in series. There's no way to avoid uh, uh, drawing a line between two points that doesn't pass through both of them. And they're connected kind of back to back, which means they're actually in series. So to get this one right here, so the one in the middle is still going to be two. But to get the one right here, we're going to have to do 1 over 10 plus 1 over 5, 5. And then we have to take the inverse of that. So let's see, what's that? 3.3, I think? Something like that? Do you all agree? And this is 5 and 10 over here. What's up? Can't hear what you're saying. Your mic's... Uh, Fuzzy. Maybe type it. Do you all agree? 3.33? Okay. And, uh, right, because it's 2 over 10, so 3 over 10, 10 thirds, yep. This one will also be 3.33 then. And now these three are in parallel this one, this one, and this one. Because again, just to show you how I do that, I say I can go from here all the way to here, only passing through just that one. I can do the same thing this way, I only pass through one. I can do the same thing this way, and I only pass through one. So I can get from this side of the network to this side of the network, you know, only passing through one of them, which means they are in parallel. And for parallel, then we can reduce them down, and we'll have just one here, and then, whoops, and then one here. So this is the 20, this is going to be um, 8.66, I think, or 8.67, however you want to say it. 
and then we can uh, do the reduction for these two. So this one's going to be 1 over 8.67 um, plus 1 over 20 to the negative 1. So that, that's why I can't do that, one, obviously. Six point oh five. So if you did this before class and you got six point oh five, good for you. So not an easy one. Okay, do you all agree? Okay. So you wanna do the other one too? They don't take that long. This one, um, both of these, the, the main trick. It's just in being able to figure out how things are actually um, connected. So here, what I would do is I'd start with these two in the middle because they're pretty clearly in series, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this like this. It's going to go like this. And then for the middle one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to notice that this connection point could have been moved up to here. And this connection point, we're going to move down to here. It doesn't actually alter the circuit in the least. And then we had a four here, a six here. The one in the middle is going to be one over five plus one over seven. Dielectric. Oh, so you want me to talk about dielectric stuff today? And yeah, we can talk about that. Um, it's also, I mean, you can read about it in the textbook. It's a pretty short section. It's not very hard to follow. Johnny, you know what I mean? We're kind of having uh, this issue where because we don't actually get to meet twice a week due to the lab splitting thing, uh, I have to kind of cut some material. So if I have time at the end of class today, maybe I'll try to talk about that. But like I said, you can read about it in the textbook or anywhere else if you want to, honestly. Uh, okay, so 1 over 5 plus 1 over 7 to the negative 1. Yeah, but is what I said not an acceptable answer, Johnny? Did you not hear what I said? So I get 2.92. Yeah, we just we just can't we can't hit on every single topic. So, um, okay, um, so this is uh, two point nine two, and then now they're all in parallel. So these should reduce down to, and again, this is one where like if you can't see that they're in parallel, um, say you're going from this point to this point, you can draw a line from here, and go all the way to here, only hitting one. Do the same thing through this one do the same thing through the bottom one and the idea is that you don't have to you don't like run into two when you do that even though there's a possibility where you can you know do stuff like that you don't have to so these reduce down to the six plus four is ten ten plus this would be twelve point uh, twelve point nine two microfarads I think is that the right answer Do you guys agree? Do you all agree? Okay. All right, so, uh, all right, that's capacitor stuff. Okay, so what we'd like to do now is to move on to talking about uh, charges in motion. And for those of you that have uh, already done the lab for this week, uh, some of the stuff I'm going to tell you is a little bit of review, but that's okay. We'll go into more detail. Make this a little bit more room here. This will be the first problem we're doing. Okay. So we're going to talk now about electric current.
All right, so if you have, yep, Evan, you did, that's right. Okay, so um, if I have a piece of metal, like a metal wire, I have a wire and consider my wire to be like a, a kind of shaped cylindrically. So I have some kind of metal wire. Um, one of the things that we know about metals is they tend to have free electric charges, free charge carriers, um, sometimes referred to as conduction electrons, that can be basically are free to move all around. And if you put, so each one of these little dots is what we call a electron. Now, if you look at a periodic table, and you look for copper, you'll you'll find that copper has a, a atomic number of like some, something in the 20s, maybe 29 or something like that. And that tells you that copper has, let's say it's 29. Let's say you have a metal that has 29 as its atomic number. It means there's 29 protons and there's 29 electrons. Now of those 29 electrons, maybe some of the ones in the outer shells um, aren't nearly as tightly bound. And that's what these free electrons are. So these are like free electrons. And by free, I mean that if you were to put a force of some kind on them, they'd be free to move around. They would start to accelerate. <clears throat> so that's exactly what we do when we discuss uh, um, electric current. The idea is that if I connect my wire up to a voltage source, like for example, a power supply or a battery, I think in the lab this week you're gonna be using a power supply, but say I connect up a 1.5 volt um, battery to this. Well, what we know is that, and, and it's assumed that these these little pieces here are also the wire, okay? Same type of wire, we're just blowing it up right here. We know that these negatively charged electrons are gonna be a feel of force in what direction? Can you all tell me? If this is the positive side and this is the negative side, what direction is the force on these particles gonna be? You can kind of figure it out if you kind of just think about what positive and negative means. Clockwise? Hmm clockwise. So you're saying that the negatively charged particles are going to be attracted to the negative side of the battery. Hmm. I don't think so. I think the negatively charged particles are going to be attracted to the positive side, right? So there's going to be a force on these particles that's going to be this way. All these particles are going to feel a force that points in this direction. Of course, that's due to the fact that there's an electric field in the wire that points in the opposite direction. What's the color I haven't used on this picture? There's also going to be an electric field in the wire that points in this direction, right? Oops. Okay, what that's gonna do is it means that these charges are just gonna start moving around, okay? And there's going to be a negative current flow in a counterclockwise direction. But in order to describe electric current, we talk about the flow of positive charge. So as a result, we're gonna say that the current is gonna flow in this direction. We use the symbol I for current, so I is gonna represent the amount of charge per second that flows through the wire. And we write it like this, dq over dt. But it, it, it's, uh, it's really just saying, take a piece of the wire here and count how much charge flows per second, right? So you could have like a stopwatch and you could be watching. It could be like, oh, I saw 20 coulombs pass by in 10 minutes. You do 20 coulombs over 10 minutes and you can figure out what the current is. Okay, the rate at which the charge flows through the circuit we use the simple dq over dt. We call that electric current. Uh, like I said, even though the electrons are feeling a force that goes to the left, the current is the flow of positive charges. Okay, so the flow of positive charge is gonna be the other direction. So the person that said clockwise, maybe, maybe you're thinking about current and that's true. So the current flows like that, whoops. And yeah. Why measure that? No, I mean, we're measuring the flow of positive charges. And what you have to understand is that when they first measured electric currents, they didn't really know that there were little electrons inside of the wires, you know? The electron was discovered in, um, I want to say, 1899. And electric current was, we kind of understood how to produce electric current in like the 1820s. Does that make sense? So it wasn't until, uh, yeah, 
I mean, that being said, like, they didn't know what, I mean, well, okay. Okay, let's, let's keep going. All right, so, uh, uh, da, 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 da. all right, what's the next thing to say? All right, so, current flow. Right. Now, the next question to talk about is, no, current's not a vector, it's a scalar. It's a scalar. We'll learn about something called current density that's a, uh, it's a vector. Oh, the units. Okay, so the units for this uh, is going to be um, coulombs over seconds because, you know, charge per second, and that's going to be equal to an amp, okay? So one ampere, sorry, it's a capital A, named after a French scientist, is one coulomb per second. One amp tends to be a really large, we, we, you can say amps or amperes, I think people usually say amps. So one amp of current is, um, is a lot. So in the labs that you're going to be doing this week, for example, you're going to be measuring milliampers, but um, that's our unit for it. Now, one thing about this that uh, is important to understand is that these electrons, as they are subjected to this force from the external electric field created by the battery, um, they don't really move smoothly from left to right. They don't just all fall like grains of uh, sand in a hourglass. They don't just all just kind of flow. They erratically move because they also interact with the material. The, so what the other thing that's here that I'm not drawing is that within the material itself, there are going to be nuclei that the, um, the electrons have to navigate as they go through here. And the nuclei are like, it's like navigating an asteroid field. There are just so many of them and they don't really move very much, except that they vibrate, which makes them easier to hit. And in navigating through here, what happens is that the path of these electrons gets, gets affected by this. And as a result, even though electrons have a very, very tiny mass, and things that are really small tend to move really fast, the actual speed at which these electrons flow through the wire is really slow. So that's the next thing we'd like to, to calculate. So we say that the, the rate at which the particles move, we call the, the drift velocity. This is gonna be the rate at which the charges flow through the, the system. And to get an idea as to why it's slow, that's what this picture here is for. I'll blow it up a little bit so you can see it better. So in the top, we have a conductor with no electronal field. And in the bottom, we have a conductor with an electronal field, uh, with, with, a, with an internal electric field. And I need to drink some more. Okay, so in this picture, what's going on is that it's saying that the blue line here, where the is a path of an electron, and it goes this way, and then down here, and then up here, and then down here, and then back here, and then back here. Why does it do that? Well, probably because it's doing something like it's bouncing off of uh, an atom or something like that. Maybe there's an atom right here and it, it got pulled back this way. And then maybe up here there's an atom here and it kind of got pulled back this way. Maybe there's an atom here and it kind of going around and it gets pulled back. See, see what I'm saying? So there's, there's pieces of the material in there that it's interacting with that's causing it to bounce around like that, okay? Its motion is erratic, okay? It's, it's probabilistic, okay? We can't predict that it was going to do that, but we can say that that's kind of what its, what its motion is going to look like. It's going to be zipping and jiggling all around inside of the wire. Now we turn on the current. We turn on the electric field in the form of putting the battery connected up. So in this picture, basically now we've uh, connected up a battery and the battery is connected up like this. Right, yep, positive side would be here because the, the electric field is going to the left. So now the per the pink path is now what happens so now due to this extra force so the electric field is to the left right but the force as you can see right here is to the right the force is this way so due to this extra force what happens is that if we follow the pink path the path of the electron is very similar but you'll notice that there's this slight distance that it is moved to the right here and then it goes up to here and again the distance has grown compared to the other path and then you get back to here and eventually you see that this is the total distance that the electron has moved relative to where it would have been if there was no 
internal electric fields. And so that's going to represent the drift velocity multiplied by however long it took for the particle to get here. Okay, does this make sense? Anyone have any questions? So that's the next thing we'd like to do is to actually figure out what this is. You still don't understand this. This is uh, this is from uh, chapter 22. If you look at the equation that says that the force is equal to Q times E, the charges in the wire are electrons. It's an electron. So the electron charge is negative. So force is going to be negative here in this case. That, that was a dumb moment for me. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> That's okay. No problem. All right. So I know it's uh, often like... It doesn't show the negative charge. Oh, I guess that that's a negative charge. It's hard to see though. I was gonna say all it really says is electron, but I guess there is a negative charge there. All right. So, um, oh, here this is just another picture. The same current is produced by positive charges moving in the electric field, or the same number of negative charges moving the same speed in the opposite direction. So, whether you have positive charges moving to the right or negative charges moving to the left, you still get the same amount of current. Now, you might ask, okay, what's the point if they're all if they're all electrons? The truth is that in some cases, the charge carriers actually can be positive charges, okay? Now, we're in all the cases that we talk about in this class, we're always going to be assuming that we have negative charges, but it is, you will see, like, in, in as you go on to, you know, upper-level classes, the, the, the charge carriers can be positive charges, as in the case of semiconductors. Okay, so let's talk about how we find the drift velocity. So that's what this picture here is for. So in this picture, what we have is just, let me go down just a little bit more. Um, a current I flowing through a, a wire and we've blown up a piece of the wire right here. And what's been drawn on here is a cross-sectional area. So this has been labeled off right here as a cross-sectional area. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say in an amount of time that we call DT, um, we're going to, let me maximize this so you can see it better. In an amount of time dt, we're going to try to figure out the amount of charge that actually flows through that cross-sectional area, okay? So we're going to say dq is going to represent the amount of charge that flows across A. In a time... DT. Then that DQ should be equal to um, the number of charges per unit volume. So I'm going to call this N. N is going to be the concentration of charges. And I'll just say right here that N is number of charges divided by volume. So it's like charge density, concentration of charges, but it's a, it's a, it's a number density. So number of charges per unit volume. So the units are going to be meters inverse. So if I, if I have that quantity, if I know the number of charges per unit volume, and I multiply by volume, Right? That should give me the amount of charge that's contained in there, right? Makes sense, right? Number of charges per unit volume, multiply by volume, but then I have to multiply by one other thing, which would be what? If I want to get the amount of charge, n times v is going to give me the number of charges. What do I then need to multiply by <coughs> to get the t <coughs> to get the amount of charge? Or to get the yeah, amount of charge. I need to do this times this times one other thing. What would it be? No. 
the charge of the electron. That's exactly right. So we'd also have to multiply by the charge of a single charge carrier. So we'll call that Q. This is going to be the charge per carrier, basically, which would be the charge of the electron. But just something to keep in mind here. Um, suppose, well, the, the charge carrier might not, that doesn't have to be an electron is what I was trying to say. Yeah, it doesn't have to be an electron. So this will be the charge of a charge carrier. But for us, most of the time, it'll be what Patrick says, which is the charge of an electron. That's exactly right. All right. So if you take the charge on a single charge carrier and you multiply by the number of charges, you get the total charge. So now we can put all this together. So now the volume within this region right here is going to be A, the area, multiplied by VD times DT, the drift velocity multiplied by DT. So that's going to give us our volume. And then we multiply by the charge. And now we can get the current by dividing dt to this side. That's going to give us that current is going to be directly related to drift velocity as little n times the cross-sectional area times drift velocity and then times q. Okay, so that's a relationship that relates drift velocity to current and because current is something we can measure, we can then go back and figure out what drift velocity is. Now we're going to use one other uh, thing here. We're going to let j, which is going to be a vector, be equal to i over a. And this is going to be equal to n times drift velocity times q. So this is what j is, defined like this. And um, J is going to be current density. And J is a vector. And the direction of J is the same as the direction of the drift velocity. OK, we'll do a problem to kind of show how these things work. But does anyone have any questions here? Yeah, I'll go up in a second. Um, here? Why don't I just zoom out? Is that better? Is that better? Okay, so this is all just uh, kind of our theory, and then we'll just look at some applications. But I wanted to look at this equation real quick here. So notice what this equation says. It says that VD, which is drift velocity, so this is VD, drift velocity, uh, is equal to the current divided by the number of charges per unit volume times the area and Q all in the denominator down here. What this says is that if I increase the current, the drift velocity goes up. That should make sense, right? If, if the rate at which the charges are flowing per second goes up, then the velocity of the charges has to go up too. That's the only way that the rate's going to go up, right? So that makes sense. It's directly proportional to current. The area shows up there in the denominator, which says that if the area of the wire goes down, the drift velocity does what? So if the wire gets skinnier, what happens to the drift velocity? Assuming everything else stays the same. It's going to increase. That's right. Does that seem reasonable? If you think about what happens to a river when the river goes from being wide to getting really skinny, the speed goes up, right? And the water gets like white. That's where you get like white water and rapids and stuff like that. If you, uh, if you have a hose and you put a nozzle on the end of the hose that's shaped kind of like a point, then the water will flow faster out of the nozzle, right? So if the area goes down, the water goes, the water speed goes up. So this works exactly the same way as that does. Uh, it also seems to be the case that uh, the other things, one other thing I would mention, by the way, is that when the area of the wire gets smaller, 
usually the current is probably going to uh, We'll talk about this in a second. Let's come back and talk about the area when we when we discuss what resistance is. I wanted to say something, but I was going to say the the resistance of the wire is going to change. So unless you alter the voltage here, it might not be as simple as just saying area goes down, velocity goes up. That's what I was going to say. So we'll revisit that here in a little bit. Okay, so let's look at a problem that we can do here. Let me just select all of these. Why is that so much? Oh, I did it. Drift speed in a copper wire. Uh, yeah, let's talk about the units of drift velocity. Sure, no problem. So the units up here, if we look at them, it would be in the numerator. That's going to be amperes. Uh, an ampere is a coulomb per second. And then in, in is in number of charges per unit volume. So it's going to be meters to the negative three, like one over meter cubed. And then um, area is measured as meters squared. And Q is coulombs. So yeah, you get meters per second. I'll let you, I'll let you do that, but you get meters per second. Mm -hmm. Well, that's right here. So no problem. Good question. All right, so drift speed in a copper wire. I might just have you all do this problem because I bet you can figure this out. Let's get it set up though. So a 12 gauge copper wire, have you all heard that before? Wire being referred to as like 10 gauge, 12 gauge, eight gauge. Have you all heard that expression before? If you have or haven't either way, it's a way of talking about how thick it is. It's a, it's not a like scientific definition, but 12 gauge wire does have a very specific cross-sectional area. Um, and then, you know what I mean? It just, it just means how thick it is. Um, I'll show you when we are in class again, different types of wire and uh, what different gauge means. But a 12 gauge refers to the size of the cross-sectional area. Anyway, so here it says a 12 gauge copper wire. Okay, it's copper. We're going to need to know that. In a typical residential building has a cross-sectional area. We'll write this down. A equal to 3.31 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared. It carries a constant current of 10 amps. So that's our new, new thing that we just learned about. So 10.0 ampere, which is just capital A. Again, that's the situation where the unit is the same as one of the variables in the problem. What is the drift speed of the copper electrons in the wire? So VD is going to be what we're looking for. Uh, we're going to assume that each copper atom contributes one free electron to the current. That's going to tell us something about the uh, charge density. And the density of copper is 8.92 grams per centimeter cubed. So we're going to use density is equal to, I'm going to go ahead and convert it for us. That's going to be 8920 kilogram per meter cubed. You could prove it for yourself, but grams per centimeter cubed to kilogram per meter cubed, you just multiply by a thousand. Um, okay, so. How do we do this? Well, we have an equation that tells us that drift velocity is equal to I over NQD, NQA, sorry. Let's scroll back up and make sure that's right. Kind of looks like an R, so I'll erase that. And there we go. So what do we have? We have I and we have A, and we have Q. We know that Q is going to be the charge on a single electron because it tells us that it's each atom contributes one free electron. So we know that the electrons are the charge carriers. So Q is going to be that. We're not going to worry about the negative sign because we're just looking for the absolute value of the velocity. What we're missing is little n. So the real the real kind of problem in this case is to is to calculate what this is equal to. How do you all think we can do it? And I'll remind you that um, n is number of um, what did I say it was charges per unit volume. Kavi says density. How do we use density to get that? Density is mass per volume. So how do we get from mass per volume to number of charges per volume? We 
we could write down density right here. Moles, then atoms, then electrons. Okay, how do we get to moles? Sounds like that sounds like a good way to go. How do we get how do we get from kilograms to moles? Something like sixty five. Can we get an exact number? I think that's 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 right, I think. Some something like sixty five point something, right? Can you all tell me what it is? Okay, so for those of you that don't know how to find this, because I imagine if you haven't taken um if you haven't taken well this one's not good okay I don't you can get a periodic table shower curtain okay I actually need a new shower curtain okay 63.5 okay yeah, I just want to show you where you can find it oh, I'm not shopping for overseas I just want to click on your periodic table maybe I need to just uh all I want to do is show you where this is located. Underneath, okay, you can't see it on this one either. But underneath copper, where's copper? It's like 29, right? There it is. There's a number right here. It's blurred out, but it's the number that they're writing right there. It's 63.5. Okay. Do you, Is it 63.55? Because if it's 63.55, then it'd be 63.56. Oh, thanks, Kyan. Kyan found one for us. That's great. We're going to click open original. It should pop up over here. Perfect. I really appreciate that, Cayenne. Thank you so much. There it is right there. 63.55. That is the molar mass of copper. And that number appears under everything, right? You can go to oxygen. It's almost exactly 16 for oxygen. That means there's 16 grams per mole of oxygen, 14 grams per mole of nitrogen, 12 grams per mole of carbon, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you're going to need that number to solve this problem, obviously. So... We're going to use 65.6 .6 because it was 65. We can use 65.55, I guess, since that's the number that was actually written there. So let's write 5, 5. Okay, so we're just going to do a conversion here. Our goal is to get to number of charges per unit volume, and we already have kilograms over meter cubed. We have one mole is 65.55 grams. We're going to need to convert. We'll put that one over here just to save space. Uh, we need to get this into grams, so 1 kg times 1,000 grams. All right, what, what's left? Moles, so what uh, Patrick said was now we wanna go from moles to atoms, right? How do we do that? How do we go from moles to atoms? I've got his number, that's right. We know that one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms. Atoms? Yeah, it's probably kind of hard to read. Okay. So now we are at start canceling things out. All we have left over now is atoms per meter cubed. And finally, what's the final what's the final one that we need to put in here? the last one going to be to get to charges per unit volume. Yeah, Patrick, you might, I don't know what's going on. Maybe you might want to plug your mic, unplug your mic and plug it back in because it's, it's really uh, sanicky. Now we're just looking for, we're just looking for number of charges. That's right. Josh got it. There's one electron per atom. That's the thing that's underlined up here. Each copper atom contributes one free electron. That's right. Good job, Josh. That's pretty hard to get. 
So it's, yeah, there we go. And that should give us the number of charges per unit volume, the number of electrons per unit volume. Okay, so this is going to give us E minuses per meter cubed. That's what the answer is going to be in. So you all tell me. Uh... Okay. Uh, go to here and then go to here. We're doing, let me just do like that. Go like this, this. Okay, and then let's type this one in. So we've got a thousand times eight nine two zero divided by sixty five point five five times six point zero two two and send to the twenty third times one divided by one. I don't think we had to put the last part in. Eight point two times ten to the twenty eight is what we get. 8.2 times 10 to the 28. Oh yeah, we should probably use the correct value here, right? This was supposed to be a three. Sorry, I'm sorry. Good point. All right, let's fix that. So this should have been a three. We'll still get pretty much the same answer. 8.45 times 10 to the 28. Thank you very much. We'll call it eight, well, we'll do that, 8.45 times 10 to the 28 electrons or charges per meter cubed, okay? Now, those of you that were saying that we need to multiply by the electron charge, we are going to now do that right here with the n times the q. So let's do it, let's solve it now. Does anyone have any questions? Putting that all together, we get that expression there. So this is going to be 10 divided by 2.2 times 10 to the negative 4, which I'm pretty sure is the right answer. convert that to millimeters, it would be 0.22 millimeters per second, which means that it would take a full five seconds for the electrons to move one millimeter. One millimeter, that is a very, very tiny distance. It takes five seconds for the electrons to move even one millimeter. That is, that is a very, very small speed. So nonetheless, that's what we get for drift velocity. And it's kind of indicative of what we said earlier is that these electrons they're colliding so much with the matter that they don't really move very much, but they are moving very slowly. And that slow march of the electrons through the wires is what provides the energy we need to light up our devices, you know, to turn on our cell phones and our computers and our light bulbs. And, you know, it always feels like electrons are either super slow or super fast. Well, to be clear, the electrons individually are still moving very, very fast. It's just that as they zip around all over the place, they're just kind of zipping around, slowly moving more and more to the right, you know? Like, they're still moving super fast, like on the order of like millions of meters per second. Yeah. Two million miles an hour. They move real fast. But on, on average, they slowly drift. And what's the question here? For VD at the bottom... You don't need to put, oh, I mean, <clears throat> so this is just number of electrons, so it's not, it doesn't really have a unit. It's a number over meter cubed. That's why I didn't put it in there. Yeah. It doesn't technically have a unit. The real, it's just inverse meter cubed. Yeah. Good question. So 
it is important to understand though that that this that this this slow charge of these electrons through these circuits here they're like our little worker bees you know they do all the work for us and they don't have to move very fast so if you think about it like there's so many electrons inside the circuit that if you get even just if they move even just a little bit that's a huge amount of energy because there's just so many of them right i mean look at that number that's how many charges there are in just a meter cubed of volume it's that many charges 10 to the 28 charges that's so many and if you get them if you get them moving just a little bit that's a huge amount of energy you know a huge amount of energy all right uh 202 we can keep going right good time let's talk about resistivity so we've defined electric current and now we would like to talk about resistivity let me get some more room here so i can move all this stuff down Ugh, what is this thing doing? That should be enough for me. Okay, so let's talk about resistance and resistivity. So whenever we connect a uh, wire up to uh, a battery, as we said before, if you take like a battery like this and we connect it up to some piece of wire, for example, um, it turns out that uh, different types of materials allow the current to flow uh, at different rates. So for a given type of material, there's gonna be a current that you can measure we measure current using something called an ammeter that you're going to see in the lab that you do this week if you haven't already seen it. And um, we measure voltage with voltmeters. But if I tell you that the potential difference on this battery is delta V and I tell you the current is I, then for given, for given different types of materials, whether it be silver, copper, gold that the wire is made out of, the amount of current flow that you get is going to depend on the type of material. Okay, So the current depends on the material of the wire. And you can figure out how it depends on that. Um, or more specifically, how the electric field depends on it um, in the following way. So first of all, here's a table that shows you different resistivities rho, okay, symbolized by rho. And resistivity is defined in the following way. You take the size of the magnetic, uh, the magnitude of the electric field that's set up in the material and you divide by the magnitude of the current density caused by the electric field, okay? And that gives you this quantity that we call resistivity. So the bigger the electric field that's produced, uh, you know, per current density, the larger this value is gonna be. And you can see what the different values are right here. They range from about 1.47 up to about 100, and all of these are multiplied by 10 to the negative eight, and they're measured in ohms times meters. Ohms is gonna be our measurement of resistance. Resistance is defined over here and I can show you how to get this um, I mean, we might as well I guess uh, go through that derivation just so we can understand what the connection between these two equations is so um, regardless we've got all these quantities right here these are all um, conductors and they have these kind of types of resistivities okay over here we have insulators and they have orders of magnitude larger resistivities. Um, things like amber glass, mica quartz, all these things have resistivity on the order of 10 to the 14. So a huge number. Yeah, Patrick, that's right. They all they all feel the electric field at the same time. So they all start moving immediately. And that's why the light from a light comes on quickly when you flip the switch. That's right. Um, okay, so insulators, high resistivity. Uh, metals have low resistivity. That means they have a low resistance to the flow of electricity. And this res this uh, relationship down here that resistivity is equal to electric field divided by J, this is often referred to as Ohm's law by the textbook, but we're gonna use something else for Ohm's law. Anyway, 
Um, let's show how we get from this equation to Ohm's law as we are going to use it. So suppose that I tell you that I have a piece of wire and that wire has a cross-sectional area A, a length L, and replay. Yeah, I can, I can kind of see that. If you R, P, L, A, that, that part of it. Yeah, I guess I can see that. Um, okay, so L, A, uh, and suppose that we have current flowing through here. So I've got current flowing through here, and the whole thing has a potential difference that we call delta V, like this. Um, and because of that, we know that the um, electric field inside of the wire is also pointing in this direction. So we have an electric field E. All right, so let's put this all together. We know that there's a relationship between the electric field and potential difference between the ends of the wire, which is that delta V is equal to the electric field times L. There's technically a negative sign here, but let's not worry about that for now. Um, we also know that the current density J is defined as we take the current and we divide by area. Okay, so let's put these two equations together. So this says that rho is equal to E over J. So if I write rho is equal to E divided by J, this is going to be the same thing as E is equal to delta V divided by L. And J is I over A. Okay, so let's manipulate this in the following way. We're going to multiply the L over here. So we're going to have rho times L. And then there's a 1 over A over here that we can multiply to the other side as well that'll show up in the denominator like this. And this should then be equal to delta V divided by I. Normally we write this by moving the I to the left-hand side so that we write it as delta V is equal to uh, I times rho L over A. And I put this in parentheses because this is then defined as resistance, R. And this is normally what most like kind of textbooks call Ohm's law. This one or this one, but realistically this one. This is the equation you're going to be using in the, the lab this week. Voltage is equal to current times resistance. Super easy equation. Definitely worth memorizing because you're going to use it a lot in this class. Okay? Anyone have any questions? This tells us that the bigger the resistance of the wire is, the smaller the current's going to be, right? Because you can write this in another way. We can write it as delta V divided by R is equal to current, right? Just as an example, suppose you have a, a, a battery that has 1.5 volts and you place it uh, into a system that has a resistance of 1,000 ohms, resistance is measured in ohms, then 1.5 over 1,000, you would get about 1.5 milliamps out of this, right? If you were to increase the resistance to a factor of 10,000 ohms, then you would get 0.15 milliamps. So the bigger the resistance, the smaller the current that you get. How do you come up with resistance? Well, let's do a simple calculation of that real quickly here. So the resistance of a conductor is equal to its resistivity times its length divided by its cross-sectional area. This is what I was saying earlier that uh, the current flowing through a wire is going to depend on resistance, which also depends on cross-sectional area. Anyway, the, the bigger that this is, the smaller the resistance is, which is to say that a really fat wire uh, resists current less than a really skinny wire. And then the longer the wire gets, the bigger the resistance gets. Those are the two things that matter. So just as an example of that, if I had a length of, let's say, silver wire that was two meters long, and I said that it was silver, and I tell you that the cross-sectional area is equal to, um, let's just use like one meter squared, then the resistance of such a thing would be rho L over A. So rho comes in here, 1.47 times 10 to the minus eight, minus 8 ohm times meters. We would multiply that times uh, L over A. So L is 2. And then A I'm saying is 1. You would get a resistance of a very small amount. 2 times 1.47 is approximately 3 times 10 to the negative 8. Ohms. So that would be your resistance for that, that thing. 
This is to tell you that if you just use little tiny pieces of metal, the resistance is going to be really, really small. So how do you get a lot of resistance? Well, you obviously need to have a really long but really skinny wire, right? So if I want to have a lot of resistance, what you need to do is you have to have a wire that is like wrapped around in coils like this. Because then it can be very long but also compact. This would be something that would be called a wire wound resistor. There are all kinds of other types of resistors, but a very common one is to just take a piece of wire and wrap it around a spool. You'll see that in the lab that you uh, that you do this week. So, um, yeah, that would be something that has long length, and um, yeah. Now you've probably seen this type of arrangement before inside of light bulbs, because the way that a light bulb works is that a light bulb has this wire that comes in, connects up to its socket, and there's usually like a little tiny piece of tungsten which has a really high boiling point that's been wound almost exactly like I drew over to the left there into this really tight wire. And the idea is you want to make that tungsten wire really skinny so that it has a big resistance. And then you want to make it so that it's um, as long as you can make it, which is why it's coiled up. And what happens is that as the electrons try to squeeze through here, they interact with the metal and they come through here and they start to wiggle through here and it causes the uh, the entire system to start to glow bright and give off um, infrared radiation in the form of light. So one thing you can say that a resistor does is it basically takes electricity and turns it into heat. So a resistor, which is basically something like this, um, transforms electricity into heat. And examples would be things like toasters, electric stoves, light bulbs, things like this. So what's an electric stove? An electric stove is basically just a coil that a coil of very high resistance material, I think it's often made of carbon, Carbon? Maybe more like iron. Composite iron or something, I don't really know. But an electric stove, right, is basically just a piece of metal that comes, you know, up and then it just kind of like wraps around in a circle, right? This is like what an electric stove looks like. And all that happens is you pass electric current through that thing and it heats up. It just gets hot. Because as you have resistance, it causes the electrons to kind of interact more with the material, which causes the material to get hotter and then you can use that heat to do work for you, basically. This is one of the great things about electricity is it can easily be transformed from electrical energy into another type of energy, in this case, into heat. Okay. Anyone have any other questions? We probably really need to take a break now, don't we? No, this is only are we like an hour and a half in? No, that's an hour in. We started at 1.15, right? Now we're good. Good time to take a break. All right, let's take a break until 2.25.